Good morning. Would you stand with us? And we're going to worship God together.
a gift it is to come and be able to worship God together. And as we worship him, he exists in our praises. He's here and he's present among us. And the things that we bring, the things that we're carrying today, he wants to have a say in. He wants to be a part of. And we can bring those things to him and come fully ourselves. And he loves and accepts us. What a gift that is through the blood of his son, Jesus. Ah, what a good God. We serve and we worship. Would we pray together with me? Jesus, thank you so much that we can take you at your word. That you say your love won't give up. Your grace is enough. You won't forget us, God. You are so worthy to be worshipped. We thank you and we praise you for that, God. Would we experience you this morning as we worship you, as we hear your word? Would we be paying attention to what your spirit is saying in this place? In your name, amen.
you unravel me with a melody you surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies that all my fears are gone and no longer a slave to fear I am a child of God I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child of God From my mother's womb you have chosen
you can have a seat. We're going to now hear a story from someone in our community about how they have learned about surrender in their life. Uh, well, my name is Scott Gerbrandt, and when I think of surrender in the context of my faith, and particularly in the season of Lent, uh, my mind right away goes to the paraphrased version that Eugene Peterson gives in the message in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, where he says, um, blessed are the poor in spirit, or blessed are you when you are at the end of your rope. Uh, with less of you, there is more room for God and God's rule. And that causes me to think of a memory that I have in my late 20s when I went rock climbing. I did a lot of that. And I was uh, climbing in northwestern Ontario. I was at the top of an 80-foot climb. I was lead climbing and uh, my body was really tired. My muscles were starting to give way. And I came to the realization that I was gonna fall. And I had to make a decision, do I keep going uh, and fall accidentally, or do I take the intentional uh, step of actually pushing uh, and actually falling on purpose, surrendering to the fall? And the reason to do this is to actually trust the system and to um, be more safe. And I found myself uh, struggling. Your mind is going, do not push away. And yet in that moment I did. And I took a 20-foot fall, and the system and my friend who was the blayer caught me. <laughs> it was great. And um, yeah, so when I think of surrender, I think of that kind of juxtaposition, that moment of, um, of intentionally giving myself to God so that God can be, uh, have God's space and to have God's rule in my life. So it's that moment, and that's what I think of when I think of surrender. We're going to continue to worship. Thank you, Scott, for sharing your story. Would you stand?
God, would we trust in you? Would we be able to trust in your unfailing love? And not just trust in your love, but would that love lead us to love others well as you call us to, Father? In your name, amen. You can have a seat. And for those in middle school, you can now head upstairs for the middle school hangout. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been set in place so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, then I beg you, father, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, with me today is a very special guest. This is Nasser al Qatani. Can we show him a bit of love? So I've had the privilege of spending most of the weekend with yeah. you, uh, Nasser, and it has just been a joy and an honor to receive your teaching, to receive so much of the insight that you bring, and I welcome you into the space. Thank and, you, brother. And I'm looking forward to the way the Spirit is going to speak through you this morning. Let okay. me pray for you today. You. Lord, Amen. open our hearts and minds by the power of the Holy Spirit. That as the scriptures are read and your word mm -hmm. is proclaimed, we would hear with joy what you say to us today. Yes, Father. Speak through our brother Nasser today. Mm -hmm. May your kingdom come and your will be done here in this place. God. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Good morning. I'm so excited. This is my first Sunday at the meeting place. Some of you might know me from Tuesday nights. I've been there a couple of times now. So much fun. I've often longed, like, I wonder, this place is so cool on Tuesdays. Have you all been here on Tuesdays? It's really cool. But I've never been here on a Sunday. I was like, what is that like? And this is really amazing. I've so enjoyed the, the worship this morning and just being here with you guys. And, you know, I, it's really weird how Winnipeg is kind of becoming like a second home for me. I, I just end up here multiple times a year. It's crazy. And I, I have such a good time. I'm not a huge fan of your winters, just being honest. But, yeah, but everything else, like, is a pretty, pretty cool place. So, um, I have been tasked this morning to tackle what is maybe one of the more challenging and I think certainly one of the more misunderstood or difficult parables of Jesus. So, thanks, Paul. Um, yeah. And so, uh, you know, I don't know how you guys have heard, you know, how it's been broken. Like, what is a parable? What? What's the purpose of parable? Why is Jesus always using parables and all of that? And I just want to give you just like just the bare minimum kind of background and context for this so that, you know, as we go to kind of dig into it this morning, we're kind of hopefully on the, on the same page. And so, um, you know, today when you, 
go and, and you want to like do a deeper study on something in scripture, right? You get like a commentary and all of that. And usually it's like this very nice, you know, breakdown. And here's just saying, well, this is what this is about and all of that. Well, um, you know, in Jesus's day and the centuries before that, you know, people were studying the Bible and still having questions. What does this mean? How should I think about this? Right. And, uh, you know, we didn't have bookstores and all that back then. Um, paper was very expensive, you know, papyrus, tablets, you know, all those kinds of things, right? And so what people used to, as a tool to dig deeper and, and think maybe at a, at a different perspective or learn how, how to ask better questions from the text, um, te- Bible teachers use this tool called parables. And they're often fr- fairly short little stories, and so they're, they're easy to remember. And, and how the parable works is it invites you to consider... Um, some kind of strange or outrageous story that at first glance like doesn't really make any, any sense. You don't even know why it's related, like why this parable has somehow a commentary on this story in the Bible, that kind of thing. But then once you, like this is how you know that you, you're onto something. You've, you've started to crack the code of what the parable is trying to show you is when you feel that very sudden, abrupt punch in the stomach. You're just like, oh, ow, oh, oh, that's uncomfortable. Oh, that's convicting. That when you get to that moment, you know you've started like, you're now really seeing what's going on in that parable. So I always tell people, when you're reading the parables of Jesus, um, and if you read through it, you're like, oh, yeah, that makes perfect sense. Yeah, like, that's just obvious truth. You didn't get it. You didn't get it. Go back, read it again, meditate on it. Talk to God about it. Look at it from different angles, you know. Pay attention to the way certain things are described or not described. Look for things that may seem to be missing, all of those kinds of things. We're going to do that this morning, but I just want to let you know, like, that's, that's what we want to, want to do. And I also want to, like, I have to be faithful to the text. You know, we're, we're reading from Luke's gospel. There are three other gospels. They all have, some of them have some things in common. They have some things different. You know, each, each author has kind of a different, given us a different perspective on the life and ministry and death and resurrection of Jesus and, and showing us these, just these different beautiful facets so that when taken together, we have this beautiful four-dimensional picture of our beloved, glorious, beautiful Messiah, Jesus. Um, and Luke's got his own way that he's doing it. And, and, and he's got... In, in this section where this parable, like this parable doesn't just come out of nowhere. It's coming out in the midst of a story. There's a narrative going on. Jesus just taught about another parable, about a dishonest manager. And then we were just told earlier in, in the same chapter of Luke 16 how, you know, the, the Pharisees heard that parable and they were kind of making fun of Jesus because he was saying nobody can serve two masters. You know, you can't love God and love money at the same time. And Luke says, well, you know, and the Pharisees, they love money, so they, they didn't really care for that teaching. Um, and then there's some kind of this weird remark about, you know, Jesus, like, you know, like the, like, the Bible is forever, guys. The Bible is forever. And, and by the way, like, you shouldn't be getting divorced all the time. And then he tells this parable. And you're like, what in the world? I just wanted you to know, like, this is, it seems like it's coming out of nowhere, but there's, there's something up, there's something going on with that. And, and it's funny, then right after this parable, he's going to talk about, like, how important it is not to tempt other people to sin, and you really need to like be very sober by like watching yourself, paying attention to yourself and what you're doing and what kind of message you're preaching about God to the people around you. So there's like, clearly there's a lot going on in this parable. We'll see what we can do in the time that we have. So it starts off, there was um, a rich man, and I'm just gonna let you know, sorry, I'm reading the ESV. That's just what I got this morning. Um, there was a rich man who was clothed in purple, is that a big deal, that he's clothed in purple? Is that just because purple is his favorite color? Well, it just so happened, you know, back then, you know, to have dyed clothing, like that was the whole process. There was a cost to that. And the, a lot of the, the dyes that people used um, could be very labor intensive or you needed like rare ingredients to get certain colors. And purple was like the most expensive. So that's like, that. if you're wearing purple, if you're decked out all in purple, that would be like if I was standing here today and I'm just like gold leaf clothing, like 24 karat head, like, you know, that's saying something. 
right? And it's saying something that I'm not <laughs> also. Um, so he's clothed in purple and, and fine linen, again, like, like, like the nicest, most expensive clothes you could have. And he, he feasted sumptuously every day. And so the implication is, so he's, he's dressed real nice, and every single day, like this is his, his life schedule. Today, I'm going to throw a huge party, like lavish feast. And if you're in the Middle East, that means so much food than you could ever possibly eat in your whole life is going to be served, you know, in one meal. And he's doing that like every single day. Huge party, apparently for himself. <laughs> Happy birthday to me. Life is good. And just feasting and just having a grand old time every single day. Now, um, Sometimes, like when you look at, at commentaries, and there's so many different people get so caught up in different things in this parable. And, you know, because Jesus just makes the talk, comment about how the Pharisees love money and all of that, people want to like, make a direct tie, like, yep, and this is how the Pharisees were being. Isn't that so awful? And, you know, they saw, spirit, you know, wealth as kind of the same thing as spiritual blessing. And so the richer you were, the more God loved you. And so, like, this was like what all of them wanted to be. No, no. That's not true. Um, you know, but the, the Pharisees had an understanding that whatever material things we have in life, all of it is a gift from God. And so if you do have a lot of stuff, then yeah, that means God has richly blessed you. But that doesn't, they didn't think that automatically meant you were better than anyone else. What that would mean is you had a greater responsibility than other people. And... On top of that, like we know from like archaeological digs in Israel today, like we've, they've excavated the homes of people in Galilee who were clearly Pharisees. And guess what? They didn't have the nicest houses on the block. In fact, it seems that even when they had access to wealth, they lived very modestly. And so this isn't meant to be a commentary on the Pharisees. Well, like who was like living like this? Other than maybe, you know, one of the, the, the four kings after king herod the great died and the land was kind of divided like maybe somebody in the royal family might have lived like but like average people nobody was living like this i think that's the point like this is this is an outrageous obscene example that nobody in their normal life knows anybody like this and i think that's part of the point right it's it's like one end of like the most extreme end of the spectrum kind of kind of a lifestyle and so now we're going to contrast it with another person and it says, so at his gate was laid. Now, who laid the person? Like, that, I mean, it means like somebody put this guy there. Who put the guy there? It doesn't say. Like, it's just a big open question that we have to think about. Well, you know, what, what would make sense? But who, so it was laid a poor man named Lazarus who was covered with sores. Okay. So already now, this is kind of a weird thing. Um, if you are familiar with the parables of Jesus, uh, you know, how often do people have you know, proper names in his parables? Like almost never. And that sometimes like trips people up when they're reading that like, well, maybe this isn't a parable. Maybe Jesus is talking about a real story. But again, like this stuff is so extreme in this parable. There's, there's no way he's talking about like a real rich man that everybody knows lives down the street and some real Lazarus. Like that's, that doesn't seem to be what's going on there. So what is he doing by like naming one of these characters. You know, even like in this parable, like just a few chapters before this in the prodigal son, like the sons don't have names, the dad doesn't have a name, right? But this guy, this, this poor man has a name that's interesting to me. And his name is, is Lazarus, um, which is just like the Greekified version of the Hebrew name, Eliezer. Um, and so this is a thing that they did. Like if you had a Aramaic or Hebrew name and you wanted to turn it to Greek, oftentimes you'd either translate the meaning of your name into like the Greek word that means the same thing, or you just take your Aramaic or Hebrew name and you just add, a, add an us if you're a male to the end of it. So it's Eliezerus. Eliezerus, say that enough times it becomes Lazarus. Okay, so that's what's going on there. Now, is there, are there any people um, in the Old Testament that have that name. Yeah, yeah, there are. Um, one of them is, ends up being um, like the chief servant in Abraham's household. And Abraham's also going to show up in this parable. And so some people think 
Like maybe there's some kind of play on that going on here. Now, I looked it up in the Greek translation that they would have had in the Bible in that day, and they actually don't write Lazarus for Eleazar. They just transliterate his name in Greek. So maybe that's what's going on, but maybe not. Maybe there's something else there. But what's, well, what does the name mean? Because names always mean something in the Bible, by the way. Every place that seems like some weird foreign word or any weird foreign name, it has a meaning. And I would so encourage you, whenever you're doing a Bible study, look up the names. Look, look up what they mean when it says that they go to this place. Like, look up, what is that, that place they went to? What does it mean? And often you'd be like, oh, wow, that's a whole new spin on the story when it says they went, you know, from hope to desolation. <laughs> like, oh, Like, you're supposed to get that if you read the original language, but when we get translations and we don't translate names, we kind of lose some things. And same thing with with the names of people, you know? When when somebody is named Deceiver and he's constantly tricking people, you're like, ugh, this guy. And then when God comes and says, I don't want you to be called that anymore, I want to give you a new name, then it's like, oh, now you understand what's going on there, right? And so what does Eliezer or Lazarus mean? It means, uh, my God helps, or God is my helper. So that's what this guy's name means. And it seems like, in this story, he really needs some help. And somebody, unknown someone, has brought this man where to get that help? To the gates of this obscenely wealthy guy. And he places him there. And Apparently, this guy is so in such a bad shape. He's not just like poor; he is physically immobile. Like he didn't walk there, he didn't crawl there. He was carried by others, and he's covered in sores. Kind of makes me think a little bit of like the story of Job. Oh, this guy's even worse off. So we have a picture of a person that's like on the most opposite extreme end of the spectrum from this rich man. Like he has, doesn't have, has no wealth, doesn't have his health, um, is in pain, suffering all the time. And there may be some of you here today or watching this who understand what it means to live with chronic pain and the toll that doesn't just take on your body, but on you mentally, emotionally, all of that, right? Like just, it's, it's just like the worst possible state, I think, a human being could be in. And and he's here at the gates of this rich man, and we're told, now verse 21, and he desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. In other words, like he wasn't even he wasn't even hoping or dreaming that, oh, if I could only sit at the table with this rich guy, if he would just like because his people are coming to his house every day to celebrate him and how awesome he is. Like, he's not even looking for an invitation to that. He's like, could I just get, like, as you're throwing the leftovers in the trash, could I just get some crumbs of that? Like, that would be my dream come true. But apparently, the best he can get are the local neighborhood dogs consistently come over and lick his sores. I love it when dogs show up in a story. <laughs> Man's best friend, right? Like, when no, not a single human can be bothered to lift a finger to help this guy, the dogs are at least doing their part, you know? And they would have known, like, back in those days even, like, there's all these writings that people had in the medical books of the time, how the dog saliva is an antiseptic. Did you know that? I'm not telling you to go home and rip off your Band-Aids. <laughs> And, and present your wound to your dog. But, you know, at the time, like, they saw, like, it was, it was something. And, and so, like, that's it. That's the only person that was showing any compassion for this guy or these dogs. And so then we're told in verse 22, the poor man died. And maybe since, you know, in this situation, as horrific as it sounds, which to me is, is like almost hell on earth, I would think, to be in, the, like to really put yourself, like imagine yourself in this kind of state. You're literally lying on the street. You're starving to death, probably dehydrated, whole body in pain, can't move. 
and then you die. Well, maybe that's a mercy. Maybe he's just thankful. If nobody else, right, cares about him, like he's, he, he dies, and we're told now he's carried again. Somebody carried him. We don't know who carried him to the gate, but now we know who carries him away from the gate. He's carried by the angels. It says in my ESV, to Abraham's side. I don't know why like English translators these days are so embarrassed by you know, the idea of you know, Abraham's bosom. Like, it's okay, like his chest, right? It's just like, and in the Middle East, it's just like, a, like it's, a, it's a, a picture of intimacy and affection and like just familial hospitality, right? It's not weird. It's okay. Um, and if you come, if you have the, the joy of coming to North Africa or the Middle East, you're going to see people, you know, who are just friends and they have no personal space. And it's okay. Like, they're not dating. They're just, they love each other. They're like family, and this is how we are with our family. It's not weird. And, and that's what's going on here. So like, he's just cuddling with Abraham. And for the Jewish people in Jesus' day, this was, like, they didn't think they were all literally, you know, after death. Like, millions of Jewish people are all like, like squeezing their heads as tightly as they can in Abraham's chest, right? But it became like just this picture for them as a people of like, peace and the, the joy of like entering into like out of this like hard, painful world and into the reward of, of being faithful to God and God's faithfulness in return to like um, comfort us. And so the rich man, he also died and he was buried. So he gets, you know, a nice funeral and all of that and a tomb and all the fancy things that come with that. And then we're told, so now in Hades which is a Greek word for just the underworld. The Hebrew word would be Sheol. So he's in the underworld, and he's in torment. And he lifts up his eyes, and apparently he he says he saw Abraham far off, and he saw Lazarus cuddled up in his chest. And this rich man, he called out, Father, Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. That's a pretty terrible picture now. You should go from one terrible image to another in this parable. Um, And so we go from this, you know, uh, picture in in the, the physical world of one guy who has too much of everything just living this wasteful, extravagant, you know, self-glorifying life, and this picture of another person who has absolutely nothing, not even his health, um, maybe even barely his own sanity. And, and now we move to the spiritual world, you know, the next life, whatever, and now their roles are reversed. And now it's this Lazarus who is now leaning on, and so the other picture of like leaning on the, the bosom of somebody um, we see this also at the Last Supper, right? Where, you know, the disciple whom Jesus loved was leaning against his bosom, you know, as they, as they ate. And so now maybe this, we can start to imagine this as a picture of he's looking and he's seeing this amazing, the, the messianic wedding feast, and there's Abraham there, and now here's Lazarus, and they're eating this glorious, you know, wedding feast um, in paradise, and, and now... So far away, but he can still see it there. Here's that rich man, this nameless rich man, and he is in fire. He's he's tormented. He's the one just in constant pain and suffering. And he doesn't even ask, like he's not even dreaming about, can I have a chunk of that chicken leg or whatever, or you know, a sip of that glass, the goblet of wine. He's like, can can Lazarus? Can you have Lazarus just dip his finger in a just like a cup of water and just let a little drop touch my tongue? And that would be the best thing ever. Now, this is also another part where, you know, people get um, tripped up on this parable. Is like, is, is that really what it, like, some of you might be sitting here thinking, like, is that really what the afterlife is? Like, we're sitting, like, snuggled up with Abraham enjoying a big meal, and we like can see in the distance all these people being burned alive forever, screaming and crying out and asking us questions. And, you know, some people want to say, well, 
It's in the Bible, so it must be true. I have to take everything in the Bible literally, which I find that people, even people that say that don't really actually mean that because then there will be other things in the Bible that they don't take literally. Um, so what, what do we do with that? Well, we've we, we got to look at the rest, the entirety of Scripture. You don't want to base your entire understanding of the afterlife or the, the age to come based on one parable. You want to look at, does the Bible talk anywhere else about what awaits us after death? You know, the, the, the life that is coming. Absolutely a lot of things. And I would encourage you, no time this morning, but do a deep dive into that if that's something that you're interested in. And then come back and read the parable and say, okay, this parable is so full of hyperbole and, and extreme things. Oh, I see what Jesus is doing there. He's not trying to make a statement of what the, it's literally going to be like, because I don't know about, like, how would you feel? Would you really be able to, like, how many of you could sit there and, like, chew on your, your turkey leg or whatever, or dip in, you know, in the hummus, you know, because there definitely would be that at the wedding supper. Um, <laughs> Trust me, it's going to be the best ever. And, and then you're sitting there, and then, oh, like at the periphery, you just see this, this warm glow and all these people screaming and like, right? I don't, I think that would disturb my appetite. I think, and if it doesn't, like if you're like, yeah, roast those guys, right? I don't know. I think you need to spend some time with Jesus and talk to him about that. That's just me. Okay. Um, so, 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 you know, Jesus is doing something, something else here. I mean, he's, I think he's trying to get us to, to think about that and like, oh, and, and maybe there is a part of me that's like, yeah, get that rich man, God. Like, that's what he deserves, right? And then it's like, oh, where is that coming from? And ah, like, this is a parable. That's what it's supposed to, it's doing what a parable does. So uh, he asked that, and so he's telling Abraham, send Lazarus, and like, and think about that a little bit. He's, he's obviously, you know, he, he's, he's trying to rely on this family connection he has with Abraham because he's a Jew, right? So he's descended from Abraham. Um, but you notice how he's, even now in this situation he's in, does he even understand why he's in the situation he's in? Do you see how he's even treating Lazarus? Even in this moment, he's in this, this picture of he's in torment in Hades, burning, roasting, horrible pain, would do anything for a drop of water, and he still seems to think Lazarus is just, like a slave? Abraham, you have authority. Make that guy do this for me. Huh. And also, what's also intriguing in this parable, you read it enough times and really think about it, how does he know Lazarus' name? He doesn't just say, hey, that random dude that's snuggling you with you, Abraham, send him. He says, send Lazarus. <gasps> Uh-oh. He, know- he knew the guy was there. He knew enough that the guy was at his gates day after day. He knew the guy's name. Oh, and he still, this guy is a jerk. Because he didn't do anything. He didn't care about Lazarus. And what does Abraham do? He says, he's so sweet, Abraham, in this parable. Child. Because I'd be like, you jerk. Like, where are you? No. Right? He says, child, remember. He's so patient. Father Abraham, remember that in your lifetime, you received your good things. And Lazarus, in like manner, bad things. You know those about those bad things, right? But now, he's comforted here, and you're in anguish. And besides all this, I mean, anyway, you know, be- between us and you, there's a great chasm and it's fixed, like it's just, it's just there, in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able, and, and none may cross from there to us. Sorry, like it's just not, like not possible. And, you know, it's kind of justice, right? Like you see that, you see it's justice, don't you? And so then he says, okay, well then I beg you, Father, send him, like he's still treating Lazarus, like he still doesn't get it. He still wants to send Lazarus like he's some errand boy. Go send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. And so whenever you see Moses and the prophets in New Testament, just understand that that, they didn't have a nice single word yet for what we call the Bible. So they call it the Moses, prophets and the writings, or Moses and prophets. 
And so he's saying, they have the Bible, rich man. Let them, like, listen to that. And he said, no, Father Abraham. Like, the Bible's not good enough. (laughs) But if someone goes to them from the dead, they'll repent. And he said to him, if they don't, if they don't listen to the Bible, they're not going to be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. It's not going to work. Like, if the Bible's not enough for them, even if, like, we're not going to do a resurrection, but even if there was a resurrection, people still wouldn't listen if they don't care about the Bible. Hmm, is that true? Is that true? Okay, there's so much here. No time to fully unpack all this, but this is what I feel like the challenge of this is, right? Um, how do you feel? Like, this is what you got to do. When you, when you go home today, just think, put yourself in all of the, like, I was, I'm the rich man, and go through the parable. How do I feel about what I'm doing and, and all of this, and what, what would cause me not to get it, even though I'm now suffering in the afterlife, and I still don't get why I'm there? Like, how disconnected from reality do you have to be to be in that kind of place? And then think about the person, like, you're Lazarus, and you go through all this life, and now you're in the afterlife enjoying this. And, like, he never gets to talk in this parable. But if you were Lazarus and you got to finally have a voice, what would you say? What would you say to the rich man? What would you say to Abraham? And think through that. And think through how the, the various parts of this parable, both the part in the, in the physical and the part in the, in the, in the spiritual world, like what, what it looks like as far as like justice and all of that, and how you feel about the justice of God, and, and who do you identify most with between like those two main characters? Where are you? And what are you doing? And what might you be responsible for? None of us are extremely, obscenely wealthy like this guy. But we all have something. We all had a means to get here this morning. And, and what if we were held to accountable with that to the same degree that this guy was? What if we knew that we were going to be held accountable? Like, what would change today? Right, like, right now with you, right? So I'm just going to go to the Lord in prayer. And Father, I'm just going to ask you to do what only you can do. We've heard your word this morning. And it is so deep, so profound, so nuanced. And Lord, we just invite your presence, your Holy Spirit, who I believe is already at work in and around each one of us this morning, to to speak to us. Because there's so many things, that, so many levels we could feel convicted on or challenged by. And, And each of us might be in a different place this morning. But Lord, the thing that we, we all need to be aware is that the things that we do in this life matter. They matter and they echo in eternity in some level. And we have all been gifted. If we have, we, if we have our health, just our health, that's a gift. If we have mobility, that's a gift. If we have any amount of of material resources, that's a huge blessing. And what are we doing with these blessings, God? Do we care at all that there are people in our communities that are lacking any number or even all of these things? Do we notice? Do we care? Or do we walk on by and just enjoy what we have? Help us, God, to to see the, the Lazaruses at our gates, the ones who have been named God will help, and ask ourselves the question, is the help that God wants to bring meant to come through us? And what are we doing about that? Jesus, we humble ourselves and we surrender ourselves to you and your kindness and your mercy in humility and repentance and ask you, God, to teach us how to live differently in light of this. In your name we pray, amen and amen. Thank you so much, Nasser, for teaching us with such passion and conviction of the Word of God. Would you stand with us as we respond? If you curse me, then
then I will bless you. And if you hurt me, I will forgive. If you hate me, then I will love you. I choose the Jesus way. If you're helpless, I will defend you. And if you're burdened, I'll share the weight. And if you're hopeless, then let me show you there's hope in the Jesus way. I'll follow Jesus. I'll follow Jesus. He will my sin. I'll gladly wear his name. He is the treasure. He is the answer. Oh, I choose the Jesus way. If you strike. I will embrace you, and if you change me, I'll sing his praise. And if you kill me, my home is endless, for I choose the Jesus way. things coming up here in the life of our community. And the first one is a upcoming U at TMP course happening right away on a Tuesday night uh, on March 5th. And it's talking about, it's a parenting session titled, Let's Talk About Sex. Again, because we had another session where we talked about sex. And the goal of this evening is to equip parents to have good conversations with teens and 
other and other, you know, maybe probably not your toddler, but maybe your younger <laughs> kid, uh, to just talk about sexuality and gender and what this means. And we're, we're pleased to make this available to you. And yeah, that's upcoming this week. The next thing I want to let you know about is our upcoming Easter gatherings. Uh, so on Good Friday, we will have one service at 10 a.m. And on Resurrection Sunday, March 31st, we'll have a 9 a.m. and an 11 a.m. And we're so excited to invite you and hopefully like some of your neighbors or friends or family. This is, this is really a great moment for us as a church to just live into literally the crux of our faith, to hear afresh the story of the cross and the empty tomb. So can't wait to see you there. Uh, lastly, another thing coming up, this is a save the day, is that we have our annual Breathe a Spiritual Retreat happening on May 10th and 11th. And this year, our, our speaker is Steve Bell. Yeah, and he's going to be le- like leading us through essentially like what it means to engage in worship. So he calls his teaching event for the journey. And if you would like to be equipped to think and pray and experience worship in deeper ways, this is for you. We'd love to see you. Again, more information will come. Uh, lastly, I want to let you know that our giving talk this week, uh, that, that you can give. Guess what? You can do that. We'll totally accept your donations. Uh, <laughs> and that's all I'll say about that because we're running a bit uh, short on time there. And I want to move to something a bit more significant. And that's just uh, an invitation to prayer this morning. Uh, We heard the news yesterday that the Rashawn family lost a dear person in their life. Um, His name was Quinn. He was 25 years old, and he had a work-related accident and was pronounced dead shortly after. And so we, we grieve. We grieve. And our prayers go out to Michael and Heather and Lizzie and Bennett and Jane and... We want to let you know that we grieve, and we grieve as people not without hope, but with the hope of Jesus. So just join me as I pray, and then I'm going to invite Nasser to come up. So Lord Jesus, Son of God, who wept at the tomb of your friend Lazarus, help us be a community for the Rashon family. We grieve with them and we grieve with all those that have experienced loss. And we put our trust in you and ask you, Holy Spirit, who is the comforter, come and comfort your people. You are the God of all comfort. And we ask that for the Rashawn family and so many others in our community. Amen. Nasa, I'm going to invite you up. And we get to throw some questions at you. And you'd imagine there was... There was... A lot of questions, and a couple of questions that came up is that people are very curious to hear a bit of, like, your testimony. What's, it's on YouTube. Yeah, it's on YouTube, that's for sure. Just Google my name. Uh, but they want to know, like, tell us about your background. Tell us how you became, like, came to follow Jesus. And why are you here, basically? <laughs> I think that's the general That's sentiment. a great question. I don't yeah. know why in most places. Yeah, just... right. <laughs> follow Jesus, and he just takes me and plops me in different countries and cities throughout the year, and so where, I'm just along for the ride. So where were you born and raised? I was raised in Saudi Arabia, um, which is very far from here, and a very different world, and much warmer. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. Much warmer. How did I come to Jesus? Short version was, you know, I was super devout, religious, um, orthodox, Muslim, young man, um, really obsessed with obeying the, what I thought was the laws of God to the letter and like just totally all in in that world. Um, and a lot of Christian people that were in my life were praying for me. Um, I will say like thousands, if not tens of thousands of people. Um, and I had a vision of Jesus being crucified and mm. a God revealed to me the truth of the gospel and I gave my life to Christ. Wow. That was like, 25, more than 25 years ago, long time ago. So ancient history. And so, and now where do you find yourself most days when you're not traveling? Yeah, well, you know, I spend probably about half the year at home in Wichita, Kansas. And uh, he's not in Kansas anymore. Not in Kansas anymore. Let's just get that out of the way. way. I've never heard that before. Um, 
And then the rest of the year, I'm in the nations or somewhere else in North America. Um, part of my time is spent um, trying to equip the church to be fully on mission with Jesus and mm. you know, seeing this gospel preached as a testimony to all nations so that we get Jesus back on the planet. Mm. And so that all of this horrible stuff that we see in the news every day that breaks our hearts and certainly breaks God's can finally come to an end. And then the rest of my time, um, I'm in the nation somewhere, often working alongside um, the local church in um, Muslim-majority countries, which means these are places of extreme suffering and persecution if you want to follow Jesus. It means following Jesus means agreeing to the fact that you're going to lose everything. You're going to lose your family. You'll probably lose your marriage. You'll probably lose your kids. You'll lose your job, lose your home, um, and maybe even lose your freedom. You might be put in prison for the rest of your life, and, or you may be executed, hmm. if not by your own family, then by the government in these places. And praise God, despite all of those obstacles, there is a movement of people from the Muslim faith to Christ right now happening in the world. And people are yeah. joyfully losing everything and laying down their lives to follow Jesus. And I get to be often in the midst of some of those stories, and it's mm. just, I feel like I'm walking through the book of Acts. So good. Yeah. Okay, next question. This parable seems to talk about a window of opportunity mm -hmm. and that our actions actually matter in this life. Yeah. So how did we get to the place where for so many, like mm -hmm. following Jesus is about saying a nice prayer and mm -hmm. not much else? Oh, I know. Like, how many of you, like, whenever you first heard this parable, or maybe even this morning, when you hear about, like, what's going on with the rich man, and, like, he, that, it's not, not just that he's in hell, but he can see, like, everybody else being okay. Like, how many of you are bothered by that? Like, bothered with that? Period? Like, that's just not, that's not okay. Like, I hope that's not true. Right? That doesn't feel fair. And so how come, I don't know about you, but what, what, the, where this parable punched me in the gut is I realized I'm more upset about what happens to the rich man at the end, like I want like, some amount of mercy for him, than I'm bothered about what Lazarus suffered in his life. Mm. Oh, no, did I just say that out loud? Wow, like why, mm. why is it that we become so desensitized to human suffering in this life right now compared to like worrying about what's gonna to happen to people in the next one. Yeah. And did they get a chance to hear really? And what if they were born here? Or what if they did like, and we're so worried about where everybody's gonna go afterwards. Why aren't we more worried about what people are experiencing right now? Yeah. And that's what got me. Mm. So I think yeah. that's mm. kind of the wake up call from this parable. I'm gonna take a couple more minutes tech team because we need it, <laughs> yes. You invited a Middle Easterner, so you yeah, just it's threw true. your schedule out the window. I, I would like to honor our guests by by doing this. Is that okay with you right? guys? Yeah. So okay, good. we have a saying in the Middle East, Western know. people have watches. I don't. We I don't have, have time. Yeah. We have time. We don't need watches. It's good. Okay. Here's our next question. In the Western world, we consume four times the global average. Yeah. We are the rich man. How can we learn to see the Lazarus at our gate? Hmm. I think it starts... Like, because what it really is, is like, obviously the rich man in the parable, he knew Lazarus was at his gate. Like, we can't say by the end, well, he just didn't know. You know, he just never left he the house. He knew his name. He knew his name. He knew he was there, right? And, and how many of you, like, you just don't know that Sudan exists, right? And that the most horrific genocide, you know, sort of like millions of people being genocided, many of them for their Christian faith, it's happening right now and the rest of the world doesn't care. How many mm -hmm. of you know that Yemen has been experiencing the greatest cholera outbreak in human history? history. Millions have died. And on top of that, from starvation, babies dying every hour in Yemen from starvation. Mm. If you didn't, now you know. Like, but what are we going to do about it? Mm. Right? Like, is we, and I think, like, I'm not trying to, like, manip emotionally manipulate you into caring. I think the only way we can really care is if we truly come to God and like recalibrate our hearts with him because I guarantee you he sees every bit of this and he cares deeply and passionately. If we spend more time in, in our prayer closets and our spaces of worship with Jesus and just ask him to come and reshape our hearts to just like be vulnerable enough, like God, I wanna, I wanna weep over these things the way you do. And then I think we wouldn't be able to help ourselves. We would act and do something. Yeah. Okay, this is a related question to this. And I think it's a good one. And I'll just say it's heavy, so I'm going to ask it. Am I going too far to make an analogy between the poor, hungry man, Lazarus, mm -hmm. and the starving Palestinians trying to survive in Gaza right now? And between the rich ruler and my own country, Canada, mm -hmm 
who has paused all UN funding for uh, Gaza refugees. Mm. Man, how long do I get to answer that question? Uh, two minutes. <laughs> right? Because, come on, right? And this is not like, this isn't about, well, you know, is, it, do, is what Hamas did on October 7th, was that okay? Well, obviously not, right? Mm. Obviously not. And, you know, but the Palestinian people elected the, well, do you, do you really think elections work like democracy here over there? Like, do you know what, it, what elections look like? People go house to house with guns and tell you who you're gonna vote for? Yeah. Like, come on, right? Um, and when you have a, a, a little parcel of land, it's just a tiny, like, go look it up on a map. It's just this tiny little spot of land, and, you know, millions of people, the majority of them, under the age of 18. How long has Hamas been ruling Gaza, did you know? Like uh, 20, since 20, 2006. Right, yeah. right? So like 20 years. So most of, like, most of the population wasn't even born when the terrorists were elected into the government. Yeah. Okay? And so like, mm -hmm. just saying, like, well, it's their fault and you know, whatever. You know? And even if it was, do we care that, that children are dying? Do we care that they are starving? Do we care about the grieving? Like, God cares. Like, oh my gosh, people don't want to read their Old Testaments for all kinds of reasons. But if you did, if you read the Torah, you would see how many times God brings up how concerned he is about who? About the stranger, the foreigner, the widow, and the, the fatherless. And there's a lot of strangers, and there's a lot of widows, and there's a lot of fatherless kids in Gaza right now. And I guarantee you, God's heart is moved towards them. And it's not about like politics or all that. Mm. It's just simply about seeing suffering and being moved to action. Yeah. Being moved, like where are the, literally the Eliezer's? Where are the people who have been named, like God mm. is gonna help me. And they're sitting there in these streets that are just rubble now, homes gone. And I have friends that are not just Palestinians, but from Gaza, right? Who in, for weeks now have no idea if most of their families are alive or dead because they have no, they can't talk to them. They can't text, whatever. They have no idea if their own mother is alive right now. Yeah. And there we are so desensitized to it. Right. We're watching, we're watching it on cable TV. These are real people. <laughs> right. You know, this isn't just like a war and soldiers fighting each other, right? These are just normal human people, just like you and me, who are suffering. And, and do we care? And if we do care, like, what are we going to do about it? Yeah. How does God want to help these people? And then add, how does God want to help these people through me? And I don't know what that is for each one of you. You gotta ask, take that to God. Maybe it's to intercede. Maybe it's to give. You know, maybe it's to get involved in some organization. Like, I don't know. Like that's between you and God. But like I would ask God, like, what what can I do, Lord, on your behalf to show your love and concern for these people? Thank you so much, Nasser, for being here today, for teaching us, uh, for sharing your wisdom. It's my pleasure. Uh, Often as we close, we invite our teachers to close with a blessing. And I would invite you now to bless mm. our people okay. and to send us off this week. Would you please stand? Abbana, Anta samawat. Holy Father, I thank you so much for the brothers and the sisters that I have here in Winnipeg represented through this body. I thank you, God, that in a world that just seems so broken by division and, and envy and hatred and so many other things, God, you, in the midst of all of that, are building for yourself a family from every type of people, language, culture, nation. And you are showing the rest of the world another way, as we sang this morning, the Jesus way. Lord, help, help us to move from this place of just like mental agreement and, and head nodding and amening to like living into it. We invite you, God, as scary as this sounds, to just totally take over our lives. Like we just want to surrender, lay it all down before you and be raised up to life again in you. Reshape our hearts and give us the mind of Jesus Christ, our Savior. What greater blessing can it be than to be your hands and feet and to bring your loving 
words of passionate encouragement to every person in this city, in this nation, in this planet. What a privilege to be your ambassadors and to proclaim your ministry of reconciliation to all people. Help us to do that. We can't do it without you. Absolutely impossible for us. But with you, even this crazy thing is possible. And so help us to do it, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And I mean, thank you, friends.